Um, thank you all for coming here and, and welcome um, to uh, the program we're having tonight, which is called Muscles in Motion, Advances in Neuromuscular Research, Diagnostics, and, and Patient Care. So I'm Robin Parks, I'm a senior scientist at the uh, Ottawa Hospital Research here, uh, Institute, and together with uh, Dr. Uh, Jody Warman Chardon, who's a neurologist at the Ottawa Hospital and uh, Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, uh, we are the co-directors of the University of Ottawa Centre for uh, Neuromuscular Disease. So what we have planned for you tonight is hopefully an informative and, and entertaining um, uh, information session on some of the things that are going on in Ottawa with respect to, to neuromuscular disease. Uh, we're, we're going to start out with uh, Dr. David Park, who's going to give you a little bit of an overview of the, he's the, he's the director of the University of Ottawa Brain and Mind Research Institute, so he's going to give you a little bit uh, of an overview of the efforts that are underway to bring uh, neuromuscular disease, um, uh, sorry, uh, neurology to unite your neurology research, neuro neuroscience research across uh, uh, Ottawa, and, and I will just have David come up now. So. Thank you, Robin. We're not related. <laughs> so you might have uh, recognized uh, that he has an S on the end of his last name. And in fact, uh, people think we are because I get his mail all the time. So thank you, Robin and Jody. And I'm going to say some wonderful things about them that will make actually Jody blush. I don't think Robin blushes. <laughs> um, it's so wonderful to see all of you here. Um, my name is David Park, as uh, Robin uh, alluded to. I'm the director of the Brain and Mind, um, and so I just wanted you uh, wanted to welcome you to our second annual Brain Health Awareness Week. Now, I see many familiar faces now. <laughs> so you are going to hear a version of the same introductory comments, uh, probably um, maybe even three or four times, right? Uh, but it's important to, I think, uh, just to emphasize. So this week is uh, pretty special for us. It's an opportunity to engage with you in the community and highlight some of the really exciting things that are going on at the University of Ottawa Brain and Mind Research Institute. So I want to take a little bit of time uh, to tell you about the Brain and Mind, sort of encapsulate why we're here. So the Brain and Mind really takes advantages of the most amazing kinds of brain and mind researchers that are here in the Ottawa, re uh, Ottawa region. And it's, it's a big undertaking because what we're doing is bringing together not only the University of Ottawa and its six faculties that actually do brain and mind related stuff, all the way from looking at brain cells in a dish, all the way to public policy. And I just spent this morning with the uh, the Dean of the Faculty of Common Law to discuss uh, some of our initiatives. So uh, not only the university, but five different major hospitals, academic centers, each with their own research institutes, and of course you have Carleton University. So it's more than 200 researchers uh, that are incredibly talented. Um, multidisciplinary uh, and who are working together in very unique ways to tackle some of the very difficult problems that we all know about in this audience. And uh, let's uh, be real, they are very, very difficult. That requires a whole lot of collaboration if we're really going to make a dent, either scientifically or in terms of how some people in this audience actually get the health report. Uh, the health services that they require. Okay, um, I think you're in for a treat today because you're just going to find um, some amazing things that are happening in neuromuscular disease. Um, and some, and I just list some of the best investigators here because there's others in the audience, are going to really tell you about the new ideas and efforts to advance neuromuscular research and treatment. And, and I think they're going to tell you that we have some incredibly ambitious goals. And let me just list some of them for you. So concerted efforts in bed-to-bedside translational research, pushing forward incredibly new and innovative ideas and treatments. And bed-to-bedside is not just a hackneyed phrase. I think they, uh, the investigators actually live that. So number two, bringing in more clinical trials like with ALS. 
to the Ottawa research community. Okay. And number three, I hope I'm not out of line, Jordan, but starting a dedicated neuromuscular clinic in our hospital system. Okay. So these are very, very ambitious goals, and to achieve this, we need a partnership. So not only amongst the researchers in the hospitals and the universities, um, we're pretty good in that regard, right? So we have the leadership of Jody and Robin. We also have, and I, and I, and I love to brag about this, world-leading neuromuscular researchers. Second to none. They are incredible. But we also need to partner up with you in the community because it's with a combined voice that we're going to be able to make the kind of change that we need to do. Okay, so, so what I'm doing now is to invite all of you in the audience to help us realize our vision in the things that I laid out in the neuromuscular um, community. So in order to facilitate this, we've started an ambassador program. So these are ambassadors who support the brain and mind, support the brain and mind, in particular in this regard with neuromuscular research. So if you're interested in supporting us, um, moving our agenda forward, uh, helping us in any way that you can, please come talk to me at the end of this session, at this evening. Um, we really want to interact, connect, and have your support. Okay? So finally, uh, the slides are up, but I do want to briefly mention this is a whole week and we've had some amazing talks all the way from Parkinson's to stroke to PTSD and first responders and of course what's happening today. Tomorrow will be a debate on stem cells. It's going to start a little bit later because I think all of you might realize that you're hungry. That's why we brought the food. Uh, 7.30 tomorrow instead of, uh, instead of 5.30. Um, and it's really an amazing agenda on the concept of stem cells. Is it really ready for prime time? And so that's going to be a very, very interesting topic in debate format. Um, and finally, on Saturday, we have our Yoga and You fundraising event. This is really critical because this allows us to do some of the exciting things that are happening in brain and mind related research. So with that, I'm going to give it over back to Robin, but I do want to say <laughs> Robin and Jody have done an amazing job of bringing together the neuromuscular research community. And so a lot of what you're going to be, and, and they didn't do it alone. I mean, there were predecessors that actually started it, but they've brought this energy, sense of collaboration, sense of mission, that I think is, is going to propel us forward in the next few years. Okay. And so it's because of that um, that we're all here. So thank you very much, Robin and Jody. Over to you. Uh, thank you, David. Um, very kind words. So just to um, I'll give you an overview of the, the scientific part of our, our uh, program tonight, uh, we're going to start out with a, a, a talk by uh, uh, myself and, and Dr. Warman, just giving you an overview of the Center for Neuromuscular Disease and some of our efforts to try and unite neuromuscular research here in Ottawa. It'll be followed by uh, Dr. Hugh McMillan, who's a clinical investigator at, at the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario Research Unit and a physician in the Division of Neurology, and he's going to talk about uh, neuromuscular disease patient care at GEO. That'll be followed by uh, Ms. Marla Spiegel, who uh, is the National Director of Research Programs and Services at Muscular Dystrophy Canada, and she'll talk about patient support and services provided through uh, MDC. And finally, we'll end off with uh, Dr. Michael Bernicke, who's uh, truly one of our shining stars here in, in Ottawa when it comes to muscle and stem cell research. And he's the director of the Sprott Centre for Stem Cell Research, and he's going to talk about muscle stem cells therapy and neuromuscular disease. Uh, so to start, I guess we need to first define what exactly we're talking about when it comes to, to neuromuscular diseases. And, and really it's diseases that affect the motor unit, and, and that includes uh, the spinal cord, the nerve that connects the spinal cord to the muscle, the actual physical junction between the, the, um, 
the motor neuron and the, the muscle cell itself, and, and of course the, the muscle cell. So any of the disorders that affect uh, these particular areas are, are what we're referring to as neuromuscular disorders. And it's thought that there's about a, a greater than 150 individual neuromuscular disorders that are grouped together in, in this category. And although individually they may be particularly uh, rare, when you combine them together, it's actually a fair number of po population that are affected by these disorders. And, and indeed, it's thought there's about a million people who are, are directly affected by uh, neuromuscular diseases in, in North, North America. And again, what we're talking about is these diseases, uh, disorders that affect the spinal cord, such as spinal muscular atrophy and ALS. Uh, diseases that affect the nerves, such as Charcot-Marie Tooth, GBS, and CIDP uh, neuropathies. Uh, the junction between the nerve and the muscle, such as myasthenia gravis. And finally, uh, disorders that affect the muscle, which include uh, muscular myotonic dystrophies, uh, inflammatory myop myopathies, and, and mitochondrial disorders. So many of these disorders are, are, are very devastating, and, and, and to be quite honest, we don't have effective uh, treatments for, for many of these disorders. So the question is, well, what do we do? Well, about 16 years ago, it was recognized that there was a, a significant concentration of, of scientists uh, working on uh, various aspects of, of neuromuscular function and dysfunction in the Ottawa area, and it's thought that the, the local research community would benefit from trying to unite um, these researchers under a common banner, and that really gave rise to the idea of the Center for Neuromuscular Disease. So it was started in about 1999, and again, it was, it was created to strengthen the interactions and collaborations of local researchers um, in neuromuscular disease. So the mission of the uh, Center for Neuromuscular Disease is to advance our understanding of neuromuscular and related disorders and enhance human health through the development and implementation of novel uh, therapies for, for NMD. So we have lofty goals, but hopefully uh, we'll be able to achieve our, our mission. Uh, originally, the, the center was, uh, was um, derived out of the, the University of Ottawa Faculty of Medicine. That's why it's the University of Ottawa a Center for Neuromuscular Disease. But really the idea was to unite lo local researchers. And on the basic side, that include researchers at the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute and the, the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario Research Institute, and actually reach out to our clinical uh, counterparts, uh, both at CHEO itself and at the Ottawa Hospital, to bring together to create a critical mass of researchers all focusing on, on understanding and coming up with new uh, patient uh, treatment options for these neuromuscular disorders. So currently we have over 50 scientists and physicians that focus on uh, various aspects of, of neuromuscular disorders. In the scientist side of things, as I mentioned, we have researchers at University of Ottawa, the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute, and also the CHEO Research Institute. And these investigators, investigators look at more of the basic aspects of how muscles functions, how neurons functions, and how they interact together in the normal state, but they also look at how things uh, interact in, in, in the, um, these disorders to try and understand the, the pathophysiological mechanisms of these diseases. On the other side, we have the, uh, the phoenicians, who are the frontline people that interact with, uh, with many of the, the, the patients and those affected with these disorders. And we have expertise, experts in a variety of different uh, disciplines, in, including uh, neurology, uh, respirology, physiatry, and diagnostic imaging. So we really have a large number of researchers with a great breadth of knowledge when it comes to neuromuscular disorders. So we hope that in bringing these people together under the banner of the Center for Neuromuscular Disease that we can indeed uh, come to um, um, some really great uh, discoveries in, in this area. So under uh, CNMD research focus, as I mentioned, there, there's two real areas. One is the basic science. So this is the lab-based research, and we've been very strong over the years in working in this type of area, where basically it's the scientists looking down a test tube or playing around with cells and with mouse models, these disorders, and trying to understand what's going on and, and understand the, the, the mechanisms of the disease, which directly leads to, to the identification of new therapeutic strategies to try to treat this, these diseases. On the other side, we have our clinical researchers, which include those that, that try to come up with new medications to treat patients, um, the clinical trials that run to test whether any of these new medications are actually effective in patients, and also the, the uh, disease registry, so we can track who has these disorders, so when, when new therapies or new clinical trials come online, we can rapidly identify uh, patients that could possibly enroll in these trials. Uh, one of the goals of CNMD is actually to bridge the gap between the basic research and the clinical research, and this is uh, what gives rise to the idea of translational research, which is the interface between the lab and the clinic-based research. So to try and bring some of these discoveries on the basic side of things and bring them into the clinic more rapidly so we can provide a new therapies in a, in a more effective and more rapid way. 
so it, in trying to uh, give rise to this idea of creating uh, the basic and translational and the clinical side of things, we came up with a, a multi-year, multi-million dollar proposal that we're, we're uh, uh, pushing forward with to try and support these initiatives. And it's called B3 for NMD, Bench to Bedside and Back Again. And there's basically four elements to this uh, particular proposal. The first is to study normal nerve and muscle development and how it's changed in the disease state. Secondly, to discover new medications to treat neuromuscular diseases. Third, implementing better genetic testing for faster diagnosis in patient, for patients with NMD. And finally, the cl clinical research side of things, which as I mentioned is the registries, the clinical trials, and improved patient care. So to give you a little bit more detail about each of these, uh, the first area we're, we're focusing on is studying normal nerve and muscle development, how it's changed in the disease state. So this is really the experiments that take place in the lab with uh, many of our researchers. And there, there's, no real, uh, there's no real trick to this. Really what we do is we're trying to uh, study the normal nerve and muscle development. So we understand how these cells work, how they function together, how they interact on a basic level in, an, in a, a regular inter individual under a normal state. This actually allows us quite a bit of insight into what happens in the pathological state for a neuromuscular disease. So we understand what happens in the normal state and we understand what happens in, in the uh, disease state. And hopefully this identifies new treatment options to restore uh, the normal state. And one of our, as I mentioned, one of our shining investigators who works in this area is Dr. Michael Renicki and he's gonna talk a little bit later about some of the work that he's, he's doing in this area. Again, the basic research in, in many cases just takes place in a test tube or in a, in a tissue culture dish uh, where we're playing around with cells trying to understand what's going on. We can get a fair bit of insight into working with these simplified systems. To give a more advanced system where we can ask some of these questions, we can use tissue samples. And these tissues can either come from animal models of these various disorders or they can actually be very precious patient samples that are generously donated to research. Uh, finally, for many of these disorders, we have animal models, whether it's a mouse model, we have fish models, we also have fruit fly models. And these are simplified systems where we can understand some of the fundamental aspects of either uh, normal development or uh, development in the disease states. And again, it's the basic science experiments that lead to discovery of new treatments that ultimately will improve uh, patient care. The second aspect of B3 for NMD is to discover new medic medications to treat uh, neuromuscular disorders. And the idea is to identify known, medica mo known medications or discover new medications to treat NMD. And one of the leaders in this uh, field of research of repurposing existing drugs is Dr. Alex, uh, Alex McKenzie, who's a, 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 a clinician researcher at um, a CHIA Research Institute. He's very much involved in this and across Canada efforts to, to move these types of things forward. And one of the examples of how this uh, was done is, is for, t for example, taking known medi medications for, uh, and using them for new purposes. So for example, Ventolin is actually an anti-asthma drug that's been used for about 30 years. But in more recent years, it's been applied to patients with congenital uh, myasthenic syndrome. And in a subset of those patients, it has dramatic effects, where these patients are now able to get out of the wheelchair and, and walk around. So this is an existing drug. It's been used for one purpose for 30 years. It's now being repurposed. And in some, in some patients, in a subset of patients, it's actually a miracle drug. Uh, the the complementary to that is identifying new medications. So there are libraries of these compounds that be, can, can be screened to try to get a benefit um, in patients or in cells uh, initially to try and get some sort of corrective effect uh, with these various neuromuscular disorders. So those are efforts that are going on uh, here. At this point, I'm going to ask uh, pass the mic to uh, Dr. Warman. Uh, So thanks very much. So as a neuromuscular neurologist in Ottawa, along with Dr. McMillan who sees uh, pediatric patients, I see a lot of the adult patients. And we witnessed the long and difficult journey to find a diagnosis for many of the 10,000 patients in Canada that have a neuromuscular disease. And the impact of not having a, di a proper diagnosis or the long journey to find a diagnosis means that these patients are on an ongoing diagnostic odyssey where it takes multiple investigations, multiple specialists, biopsies, MRIs, repeated nerve connection studies, and still not having the right diagnosis. Not finding the right diagnosis or a delay in diagnosis means that you don't have the right treatments. And we're, so not even finding the right treatments or not being able to be part of clinical trials. Worse yet, you can prescribe the wrong treatments and be a treatment non-responder when really it wasn't the right treatment in the first place. 
it's very hard to plan for the future if you don't know how your disease is going to progress or how it's going to impact um, your function. And from a functional perspective, not knowing how you're going to do or genetically how it's going to affect your family. Those are big worries of patients that we see in the clinic every day. So on the third element of the B3 for, for NMD, one of the things we want to tackle is better diagnosis. And to have a better diagnosis, so even a couple of years ago, we'd see a patient in clinic and you do one gene test, I'm like, I'm sorry, it's negative. Do the next gene test, we'd be sorry, it's negative. But now we can look at 22,000 genes at the same time, just in a couple of years. So for patients that have never had a diagnosis, it's revolutionizing the length of time it takes to have a diagnosis and to actually have a correct diagnosis. And so one of the, the real strong researchers in Ottawa, and you probably recognize she's been all over the news lately, which is fantastic, is Dr. Kim Boycott. And she is a researcher in Ottawa that has a $16 million proposal called Care for Rare with Dr. McKenzie, and that's to improve the care for patients with rare disease. So identifying the rare disease and finding the proper treatments. Part of the B3 and NMD, there's two different aspects. So one of the rare disease registries that Dr. Park said had talked about. So within Canada, there's something called the Canadian Neuromuscular Disease Registry. So basically, we want to register patients for the pharmaceutical industry and as well as for government to demonstrate that the rare diseases, when put together, aren't that rare. And this can change policy and bring clinical trials to Canada. The second aspect is international collaboration. So even ALS, which is a more common neuromuscular disease, still isn't that common. And so when we bring all the patients together internationally, we can move forward with different treatments that can make a difference and avoid treatments that can make people worse. So in Ottawa, we've heard the patients. We know that the transition to Chia from Chia was not easy. We know that we're still offering fractionated care. It from, it's not being offered in one uh, neuromuscular center. There's divided diagnostic testing between the different institutions and we're not, we still are not able to offer large clinical neuromuscular disease trials. So our patients are going to Toronto and Montreal and London and things that we should be able to offer in Ottawa. So one of the things that we want to move forward is a dedicated neuromuscular disease clinical trial and uh, diagnostic unit. So this would be different than what the services that are offered by the rehab center, but to improve the diagnosis and to actually be starting clinical disease trials in Ottawa. And part of that would be actually building a big dedicated unit within the Ottawa Hospital to transition patients, the adult patients from CHEO, and to be able to offer trials and, and improve training environment for the trainees. And that leads us to the training of the next generation of leaders in neuromuscular disease. So it's fantastic that we have such an excellent pool of resources and human resources and moving forward now, but we have to train the leaders of the future, and that is our job. And from a basic science perspective, we have a, offer a very broad and innovative training environment for the patient or for the patients, for the students in their master's program, PhDs, and postdoctoral <coughs> students. And one of the things that we initiated with the generous support of the Brain and Mind Research Institute under Dr. Park, who had spoken earlier, is a $250,000 initiative. So we're offering training scholarships to the top students, and these are merit-based scholarships to uh, advance the research that they're, that they're doing, and that way we can retain our, our top uh, trainees in Ottawa. And you can see these are the winners of last year, so they have very innovative basic science projects that are moving forward, and were assessed by a panel as being, as being the best projects. Oops. Oh no, that was the button I was not supposed to touch. I think. <laughs> there we go, okay. So on the so we talked about the basic science side, now on the clinical side. So we want to offer an excellent program, comprehensive program for the medical students, for the uh, residents, and as well as building a fellowship program. Because as we're building this clinical unit, we want the doctors that see you now and in the future to be able to take excellent care of you, to recognize the signs of patients getting sick, to recognize the signs that a treatment is working, that people are getting better. So as part of this neuromuscular disease unit, we want to offer an excellent training environment from a clinical perspective. We also want to start a fellowship program. So basically, once someone is done undergraduate, medical school, residency, then there's something called a fellowship. And that's where people subspecialize in neuromuscular disease. So we want to create a, a, um, a very innovative fellowship from a diagnostic and treatment standpoint in Ottawa to attract the top trainees across North America. Now back to us in Ottawa, as far as from a patient group. So we are committed to patients in neuromuscular disease, and it's a very important part of the CNMD mandate that we're listening to the patients so that, to ensure that our research is patient-focused. And part of the commitment from a, um, a community involvement, so we participate in many different projects uh, across uh, during the year. 
And one is the MDC Walk. So we participate almost 15 years with the MDC Walk. And this is sort of a subset of, of people that are involved. So we bring out our families, the trainees, and clinicians and scientists to support patients living with neuromuscular disease. And this is the ALS Walk this year. So these are their very enthusiastic and wet and cold scientists that participated in this. And Brian Parsons is an ALS advocate. And he is someone who's a, a very uh, wonderful community uh, champion for ALS and actually had the federal legislation change for compassionate care. So I don't know, you probably heard the news over the past few weeks. So compassionate care was just six weeks and now it's been extended to six months. So for many of us who've had patients or, or family members who are sick with neuromuscular disease, that's a very important initiative. And he recently actually had a park named after him a few weeks ago, which I think is a wonderful initiative. We also want to open up the labs uh, at NCNMD so that patients and their families can see where the magic happens. So we're going to have a scientist for the day, an open house lab, uh, in a few months, and we'll uh, broadcast that so that patients and their families can come into the clinic and sorry, into the laboratories to see you know, how to be a scientist for a day. So people often ask us how we can help. We've got patients or family members or loved ones or want to support this important cause. So one of the things that Dr. Park had mentioned is the UOBMRI Ambassador Program. So we'll be setting up a neuromuscular disease board in the next year, and we're looking for ambassadors and champions for the community to help bring these important initiatives forward. From a clinical perspective, there's two aspects. So when you're seeing your doctor, ask them about the registry. So there's many important registries that we can participate in Canadians that can help bring clinical trials to Canada and also highlight the importance and prevalence of neuromuscular disease. And when patients are giving blood, so often when I have patients with rare disease, we enroll them into clinical uh, research projects. So if someone's the only one or two patients in the whole country with this rare disease, that's, those are precious samples for the researchers to, to see if the, the potential therapies that they're working on can be effective. Support trainees. We want to bring the best and the brightest to Ottawa, so we always encourage patients to support trainee, either fellowships or uh, postdoctoral fellowships or uh, student projects and the wonderful research laboratories that we had talked about, or that Dr. Parks had talked about earlier. So we want to thank you for coming out tonight um, and talk about from the centre. So I talked a little bit about uh, the auto hospital and some of the, from an adult care, and now Dr. McMillan will talk about some of the care at, to offer to CHEO. Thank you very much for your time. I'm a, uh, I'm a neurologist at CHEO and a pediatric neuromuscular specialist. And I feel um, every day when I go to work, I feel very, very grateful for, um, for being able to work at CHEO and to be able to work with um, the amazing team that I have. We run a multidisciplinary neuromuscular clinic for, goodness, 200, 250 children with various types of nerve, muscle, spinal disorders. And um, we work as hard as humanly possible to try to figure out what it is that any given child has. Um, to actually come to a diagnosis and then to work as hard as we can as well to overcome obstacles with our patients and their families and um, to try to make things possible. Uh, we, we don't like to use words like can't, we like to try to figure out how we can make things possible for people in their, in their own way. So um, again, I feel very grateful for my team. What I'd like to do is, um, I'd like to talk just very, very briefly about three examples of, um, of different neuromuscular disorders um, that we follow children at our clinic. Duchenne muscular dystrophy, spinal muscular atrophy, and uh, myotonic dystrophy. And, um, and I'll mention some of the work that's being done for each of those. Duchenne muscular dystrophy is um, a condition that we see in about one out of every 3,500 boys. It's a disorder of muscle that's genetically inherited. And boys that have this condition will usually show symptoms before they're five years old. They'll show symptoms of muscle weakness, falling, toe walking as a result of uh, heel core contractures that develop. And one of the things that we see in the boys are, are very prominent calf muscles. Uh, the proximal muscle weakness that we see um, in this video when it plays, um, it'll, if it does play, uh, you'll see a boy that's having a bit of difficulty getting up from the floor as a result of that. We'll just move on. So what happens with, um, with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, when I explain to the patients that I work with, I kind of liken dystrophin, 
which is abnormal in boys that have Duchenne muscular dystrophy, as being a lot like the shock absorbers in a car. So on the left is the shock absorber, which is a, you know, very easy for us to picture that. And on the right is this really complicated protein structure that sits in the membrane of every muscle cell in the body. And there's a pink little loop there that's dystrophin. And that's the shock absorber in our muscles. And when that dystrophin isn't functioning properly, or if it's not there, and we don't have that shock absorber, our muscles tear. And when they tear, the muscles get progressively weaker. There have been some, some treatments. Uh, we do offer corticosteroids, either deflazacort or prednisone, to try to help to slow down the damage that happens to those muscles as a result of that chronic tearing. But although there's advantages to using corticosteroids, or steroids as we sometimes call them, they make the boys walk longer, they help their heart, lungs, and spine to be stronger. There's a tremendous number of um, possible side effects that we see with it as well. Anyone that's known anyone who's been on steroids for months or years may be aware of that. That leads us to um, a study that CHEO is part of, which is called the 4DMD study. And this is a, uh, an international study that's led by two main research, one based in the, in, uh, the UK, and another researcher that's based in the United States. And CHEO is one of about 30 sites across the world that's involved at looking at the different steroids that are used to treat uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy to try to determine which steroid regime is best and which steroid regime is associated with the least amount of side effects. Um, so that's something that I think is a real feather in the cap of CHEO and in Ottawa, and that not only we're, um, we're working as hard as we can to, to make the lives of the boys that we follow in our clinic uh, top-notch and best quality of care, but we're also working internationally to try to um, determine how treatment should be moving forward. There's um, some work that one of my colleagues, Dr. Leanne Ward, is doing. Leanne is a bone health expert that's internationally renowned, and, um, and I have done some work with her looking at treatments for um, osteoporosis that has resulted from the use of chronic steroid use. And there's three x-rays here, and believe it or not, they're all from the same boy. On the left, um, you can easily see that instead of a, a brick-like structure for those vertebrae, they look very caved in or scalloped out. And that's the result, unfortunately, of years of steroid use. In an attempt to keep the muscle strong, it's caused some weakness of the bone. And Leanne and other researchers have proven that um, bisphosphonates are very safe in these boys, and they can have miraculous improvement at allowing the bones to reshape. And she's moving forward, setting some international guidelines with regards to bone health surveillance, with regards to treatment of um, osteoporosis, and looking at when the best time is to start this sort of thing. Sherry Katz is a respirologist at CHEO and a member of our neuromuscular clinic, who's also done some fantastic work. She's looking at this really simple, cheap device that's called a lung volume recruitment. And, um, by using that on a, on a daily basis, she's asking the question, can that reduce pneumonias that these boys who have weak respiratory muscles develop? Will it reduce the number of hospitalizations they have? And will it ultimately improve the length of their life and the quality of their life? Uh, this is, although it's not a curative study, um, some of the, um, there's a tremendous amount of work that's being done on that now. These are studies that are having a huge impact, um, making sure that tax dollars are spent in the right way, but also making sure that we, uh, we keep people healthy and keep people out of hospital. There's another exercise study that I've been part of with Leanne, and uh, looking at various types of exercise, including um, whole body vibration therapy, to see if by keeping muscles as strong as possible, that also can keep people walking for longer. There's um, partnerships that our neuromuscular clinic has had with industry. Uh, we're currently part of one um, regulated clinical trial with Lilly that's looking at a compound called Tadalafil to see if that can also be associated with improving strength and improving um, uh, the function of uh, the boys we follow with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. In addition to the tearing of the muscle fibers that I sh uh, mentioned a few slides ago, there's also a thought that 
uh, with the shed muscular dystrophy, there's also some lack of blood supply or some interruption of blood supply that may cause further damage. And this one particular drug is looking to see if that can be reversed and if that can, can be associated with increased uh, length of time the boys are walking. Um, I promised uh, Dr. Warman I would uh, not show um, slides, but I am going to show this one because it's quite dramatic. And um, when I first saw this, I thought to myself, my goodness, I didn't even know you could do an MRI of a mouse muscle. But uh, this is a mouse that has the mouse equivalent of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And after the mouse has been exercised, there's a tremendous amount of swelling in the muscle. That's a sign of ischemia, lack of blood supply. And then when that little mouse is given the Tadalafil, um, you don't see that edema to suggest that by improving the blood supply, it certainly helped that mouse's muscle. Maybe I'll skip over those. There's another study that we've been involved in with industry that um, looked at something called uh, a myostatin inhibitor. And myostatin is something that um, everyone has, al almost everyone, and its job is to try to put the brakes on muscle growth to eventually say, okay, body, you've made enough muscle, you can stop now. Um, so if you give someone a myostatin inhibitor, then that may take the brakes off and allow the muscles to get bigger again. And what really tipped um, industry off to that was seeing animals like this. They look like Arnold Schwarzenegger equivalents <laughs> of, uh, of cattle and greyhounds and mice. And these are animals that actually, um, by some fluke of nature, have had a genetic mutation involving their myostatin genes and produce these massive muscles as a result of that. So it's looking at, um, at a biological agent that potentially could target that myostatin, turn the muscle production back on, mm -hmm. and increase the, the muscle size and uh, proliferation in the body. So very impressive stuff that's going on. And these are in the clinical trial stage. Um, this is just a, I'm not gonna go through this in any detail, except to say to you that um, there's a lot of different studies that are looking at um, both the direct and indirect ways we can try to improve dystrophin in the muscle, to try to um, bring it back, replace it, um, fix it in different ways. Some of them that have gone on to clinical uh, trial stages with various um, amounts of success. Um, spinal muscular atrophy. And these are just a couple photographs of uh, two individuals with SMA that have been taken from their public blogs. Uh, but spinal muscular atrophy is a condition that affects motor neurons, and the nerves that extend from those motor neurons in the spinal cord. And as those motor neurons unfortunately die off, the muscles that they connect to become very, very weak. There's different types of SMA, and um, the details of the different types are less important except just to point out that they do exist along a continuum where there's some people that have very, very severe forms of it and those people will never sit because their muscles are so, so weak. And then other people that are able to stand and walk and take steps for their entire life. And why that happens, without going into a lot of detail, is because people that have SMA, they lack a particular gene that's called SMN1, but they have, we all have backup copies this other gene called SMN2. And that's less important except to say that there's been a lot of therapies that have been looking at trying to target SMN2. We know that it has about 10% the activity of SMN1. So if we can upregulate it, if we can make that naturally occurring backup copy of that gene work harder and do its job, then potentially we could rescue people from the an SMA type picture and, um, and allow them to be strong, especially if we catch it early enough. So very, very exciting clinical trials are happening in that area. And Dr. McKenzie, who um, both uh, Dr. Parks and Dr. Warman spoke about earlier, he has found that by looking at low-dose celecoxib in some of his mouse models, it's improved the amount of SMN2 that's expressed. So we have permission from Health Canada, and we're just in the last stages of um, permission from our research ethics board to move forth with a clinical trial to see if we can increase SMN2 in, um, in the cells of uh, uh, people that have SMA. That's very exciting. The very last one I'll touch about just for a minute is um, congenital myotonic dystrophy, which also is a disorder of muscle. It's a disorder of impaired muscle relaxation, and then as a result of that, weakness, predominantly distal as people get a bit older. But it has effects on other body systems, including the heart, um, the pancreas, and the eyes causing cataracts, and also causing some sleep apneas. 
We have a very large group of people in Ottawa that have uh, myotonic dystrophy, congenital myotonic dystrophy, in part because it's such a prevalent condition in, um, in the French Canadian the Quebecois population. So it's a, that's a very, very important area for us. And one of my um, students that I've worked with has done a very good study looking at the cardiac arrhythmias of children to just to try to help guide us with regards to guidance and surveillance testing for children that have that. And there's a lot of research that's starting to come down the pipes looking at this condition and seeing if there's a way that we can make those muscles work more effectively and work better. So I'll stop there, and um, there'll certainly be lots of opportunity at the end. I'm happy to answer questions either in the panel or you know, as we mingle around in the audience. So thank you. Next, our other speaker will be talking from Muscular Dystrophy Canada. very much for inviting me here this evening to speak with you. I really appreciate it. And um, I, just full disclosure before we begin, I am not a researcher or a scientist. I um, work with the patient organization and I'm here to tell you a little bit more about um, Muscular Dystrophy Canada, what we do, how we can help and ways you can engage with us. Um, and MDC really sees ourselves as that conduit to achieving some of the goals that we've heard about tonight, this evening, and, um, and I'm, I'm very pleased that we were included to uh, represent ourselves here tonight. So, uh, yeah. so we're a community uh, dedicated to providing a brighter future. We have a very positive outlook, um, fighting for fighting for a cure um, and those curative um, uh, is definitely the, the end goal, but in the meantime, we're here to help patients and families live their lives to the fullest. So I'm just gonna pause for a minute. I'd love to get an indication of who's in the room. Um, so can I see some show of hands or some kind of indication of um, who in the room here is uh, currently living with a type of neuromuscular disease? And what about uh, patients, uh, families, sorry. So like you have a family member or a close friend? Yeah, family or friend. Um, and what about a healthcare provider or scientist researcher? So a mix of, of all of the above. Um, who has heard of Muscular Dystrophy Canada before? Oh, okay, that's nice awareness. That's good to see. Um, and what about, last question, um, who's used Muscular Dystrophy Canada services or participated with the organization as a volunteer or as some other way? I'd just like to point out the wonderful volunteers that we have from our Ottawa chapter community right here in the front row. And nice to see you and thank you for coming out this evening. Um, so there'll be plenty of uh, opportunity later during the mingle. Um, please go over if you're interested to learn more about the activities in the Ottawa area. Um, these folks uh, definitely can tell you all about the Ottawa activities. Um, as the national director, however, um, I'm responsible for the research program and the services that we deliver from coast to coast. Um, Muscular Dystrophy Canada is a national organization. We've been around for 60 years. Um, our, our focus is indeed to fund research and to support um, patients uh, through service provision and uh, various um, uh, programs, which I will give you some examples of in a little while. So. Some of this was already covered, so I'm just going to sort of fast forward through some of those slides. But um, how many neuromuscular disorders, and this was mentioned earlier, um, do we think there are? And this is so Muscular Dystrophy Canada covers this broad, um, diverse group of neuromuscular diseases. Is it A, 60, B, 162, C, 200, or none of the above? Anyone want to take a stab? C, 200. 
It's actually just on our like approved list. It's 162, but there's like it's not an official an official number in that you know it depends on how many subsets of and subtypes there are. So um, Dr. Uh, Hugh McMillan was just talking about SMA, for example. So there's at least five different types of SMA, three really common ones, and a bunch of other subtypes. So I don't want to dwell too much on that, but um, I'm, I threw it into the slide simply because, unfortunately, with the name Muscular Dystrophy Canada, there's a lot of misconception out in the, in the broader community around who we can support, who we do support, um, because uh, someone with an autoimmune um, disorder might not readily identify themselves as falling under our category of neuromuscular conditions. So I do like to um, be specific that our uh, mandate is very broad around all neuromuscular conditions, not just muscular dystrophy. So we've been around for 60 years um, and and our, we have a very strong uh, commitment to funding research and I'm exceedingly proud to say that um, we fund uh, some of our speakers here tonight, uh, others in the audience. We are um, big supporters of the Ottawa um, basic science and clinical science uh, community. I won't go into the types of um, projects that we fund because I have brought with me hot off the presses um, this publication. They're outside. If you didn't grab one on the way in, please, please um, make uh, a point of grabbing one and taking it with you on your way out because the, the, the whole point of this publication is to share um, the wonderful work that is being done across the country that MDC supports. And we talk in this publication about the various programs that we have to, to fund research and, um, and lots of really good information about that. So um, again, I, uh, my talk today is really to focus primarily on uh, the services and supports, um, but please, um, even during questions, I guess you can also um, ask anything about the research. But that being said, there is one thing from last year that I want to highlight. And we've heard this theme earlier already today from our other panelists um, around the importance of working together. And Muscular Dystrophy Canada is very, very collaborative in its nature. We know that we are not doing anything alone. It is all about coming together. And so several years back, uh, we identified an opportunity to fund a research and clinical network and that came to fruition last year. Um, partnered money was put forth by our, our health charity as well as by CHR, the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, and we've just gotten this network off the ground. Um, my student colleagues here are part of it, and it's neuromuscularnetwork.ca is the website. It's just getting started, but there's some amazing things that will be coming down the pipeline that will relate directly to um, patients' education, that kind of translational information that we were hearing about earlier. Um, one thing I'll say is that there will be a, a, an online, we're calling it a portal, but like an online, safe, secure version of Facebook for translating that into um, what uh, so a place for patients and uh, caregivers to to seek support in community because that's very important. Um, another important piece that this bridges the services and the uh, research area is a theme of respiratory care. So we heard about bone health, we've heard about cardiac health and the importance. Well, um, again, several years ago, it um, became such a pressing issue uh, around respiratory care that our board of directors selected this as the, the primary focus um, of uh, our, our investments for the next few years. And we've produced a patient handbook. It's available in French and English, um, online and in print. Um, and the handbook is really, you know, I say we produced it, but really the content comes from the clinicians um, who are leading um, the charge to really prevent respiratory uh, complications and to treat them. And one of 
those leading real doctors is here in Ottawa, Dr. Douglas McCann, and if you don't already know him, I suggest he would be a very good person to um, get to know, and he's featured and uh, very instrumental in helping us develop this patient education tool. There's lots of online resources on our website, um, and we are trying to spread awareness about um, various treatment options, preventative options. We saw the lung volume recruitment um, device, um, and that is indeed one of the pieces that can make a difference. And of course, funding research. So um, we are a week away from announcing our new uh, grants that we're going to be giving out for uh, respiratory research, and this is the translational kind of projects that will um, be very relevant. Uh, they're not the basic science relevant to patients in a in a um, direct way. Obviously, basic science is extremely important, but this targeted program um, does not uh, include basic science. Um, we have other programs for that, and again. You can find out all about that here. And we are, um, so this that will make eight projects of, of a, just over $300,000 in, in investment over the last two years uh, for respiratory research in particular. So our services, education information support, financial assistance, um, perhaps, let me see if I can just, um, so these are all things that our small but mighty team of staff and uh, volunteers, like the local volunteers from your Ottawa chapter, um, help to deliver across the country. So I have another little quiz question here. Oop, I think I went the wrong way. Did I? Oh, maybe I skipped the quiz in the end. Um, so this slide just says, you know, that we recognize that finding the right expertise these are rare conditions, and services um, can be difficult. And so one of the very important uh, programs that we offer is that we're here. Um, that, that network of staff and, and volunteers are really well connected and can help guide and direct you to the services, supports, and referrals that you are looking for. So to that point, we get a lot of incoming calls and questions and so this is the survey question, is how many did we respond to in 2014? 100, 1,000, 10,000, or 100,000? Anyone want to take a, a guess? Shout out a number. See, 10,000? D, 100,000? Well, um, the answer is somewhere in between, actually, because it depends on um, how you, you slice it. So I always look at the national picture again, 26,000 nationwide, and in Ontario alone, it was um, 10,000. So a significant number of, of engagement in Ontario. And these calls aren't only from patients. They're from family members, they're from employers, they're from healthcare providers, OTs, PTs, allied professionals. Um, Anyone who is engaging um, with someone who has concerns around neuromuscular disease, they don't know where to turn, they turn to us and we help bring um, them the information that they need. Um, and then we also have, I'm just going to skip through that because we, uh, so the goal is simple, to give Canadians living with neuromuscular disorders the information and support so that they can live healthy and um, the best quality of life possible. And we do that in connection. We don't do that alone again, I mentioned that. Um, so we do that with our partners in the clinic, our partners, um, the researchers, and other um, patient organizations as well. Because, um, and I sort of skipped stuff, but the, the issue of advocacy. So if there's um, a concern in Ottawa that there is no ramp, I'm making this up, but I'm looking at the stairs here, and I, at the window here, and I see these lovely stairs, and if there's an issue regarding access, um, and someone in a wheelchair can't access a building, well, that's not okay, we know that. Um, well, it's not a muscular dystrophy issue, it's a, it's a disability issue, so we work together um, with our uh, local, provincial, and federal uh, appropriate bodies who are advocating for um, things where we share a common interest. An example. 
all that's very simple about the RAM is, is just an example. Um, so we send out information. So that is our phone number. Um, Google us at or just go to muscle.ca and the point is we're here to help and so um, please take advantage of that. And one probably our most well-known program is our financial assistance program and unfortunately there's great inequity um, even though we, we sometimes fool ourselves that wherever you live in Canada it's the same, it is not. Um, and so there's quite a bit of inequity of where you live um, means what type of uh, financial support you would receive towards um, very vital medical equipment. So whether it be a wheelchair, your hospital bed, uh, your breathing ventilation devices. And it's not, it, it, here in Ontario we're lucky we have ADP which covers 75%, but that is not the same scenario across the country. So once again, we involve ourselves in advocacy, but um, Advocacy takes time. It takes, all, it takes time, concerted effort, political will, a whole bunch of other factors that you can't control in order to get policy changed. So that doesn't mean we don't do it, it means we do it, but that, what are you going to do in the meantime? So in the meantime, we provide direct financial assistance to folks um, who need access to um, equipment and um, also we do some home renovations and we hope to be building up um, a fund in order to be able to do more home renovations because we recognize that that's a very big need in the community as well. So um, in 2014, we provided over one and a half million dollars in direct financial assistance to help people purchase the equipment that was prescribed for them by their healthcare professional. We do not use any form of means testing, so some provincial programs look at um, what your income level is and then make a cutoff. We do not do that at all. Um, we do ask that you go to your private insurer first so that we are the fund of last resort. And the reason for that is we're funded from donor dollars. We are not a United Way agency. We do not receive a plethora of um, federal money very little, uh, in fact. So we're funded from the walks that you saw the photo of earlier, and thanks to the, fun, uh, the fundraising at the chapter level and firefighters, um, who are our biggest nationwide um, cheerleaders and supporters. We thank the firefighters. If there are any in the room, thank you. So um, that is the reason why we have structured our program around financial assistance the way that we do. Please go, um, if you're interested to hear more about any specific program, go to our website, talk to me, reach out. Um, we'd be happy to provide you with further information about how we can help. Um, and not only can we help you, but really this is a together. So I encourage everybody here to join us to learn more about what we're doing, how you can help the network, um, the, all the wonderful initiatives that are, are happening. Um, it is a very exciting time in neuromuscular disease research and there is progress being made and I'm thrilled to be here tonight to um, be able to tell you a little bit more about Muscular Dystrophy Canada. So thank you again. Uh, thank you very much, Mark. It's uh, my pleasure to, to introduce to you uh, Dr. Michael Renicki. So, um, Dr. Renicki is a Senior Scientist and Program Director in the Regenerative, Regenerative Medicine Program at the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute. And many of you may have uh, already encountered him before because he's been written up many times in the popular press due to his, his very key findings in muscle and stem cell uh, research. And, and perhaps the best way to describe his contributions to the field and, and to, to uh, research in general is that uh, Michael has, uh, is an officer of the Order of Canada in recognition of his, his muscle work. So, well, I'd like to begin by uh, thanking all of you and each one of you for coming out tonight and, uh, and listening to us speak. Uh, 
Robin did ask that I present a lay talk on kind of some of my recent research and not be too detailed. So I've been practicing speaking in a monotone. Uh, I'll, uh, I have about 600 slides. I'm going to be an exam after we put it. So, uh, just kidding. So this picture over here is Robin uh, in, in our new NMR machine. You look great, Robin. Uh, so before I begin, also, uh, I'd like to point out that uh, stem cell research really um, has its roots in Canada, and that this is an area of strategic strength in Canada. Stem cells were first discovered, or first proven to exist, uh, by James Till and Ernest McCullough, shown here in this photograph. Uh, they published their first paper in 1961. Uh, their work really defined all the different uh, important issues that, that need to be addressed and are still being addressed. I keep talking, he said. I'm too tall. It's the elevator shoes I'm wearing. Uh, and really, they should have received the Nobel Prize, but they were, uh, you know, we're, we uh, as Canadians, I think, are too modest. We don't push ourselves on the world enough. And, um, uh, but it's real tragic that they did. Uh, Ern Ernest Capella passed away a few years ago. James is still going strong. Along this timeline, uh, neural stem cells were discovered by Sam Weiss, working in Calgary. In Toronto, Derek Vanderkoy discovered retinal stem cells. Uh, I discovered uh, muscle stem cells, and many other con key contributions, like cancer stem cells, were all Canadian. To this day, Canada remains very, very strong in stem cell research. So this is something that all of you should be very proud of. And uh, whenever you meet a politician these days, tell them that we need to support science, research, and innovation, and, yeah. and help them. No one's talking about it in this election, which is very strange. OK, I'm, I'm going off on a rant. Excuse me. I'm not easy to get started. So um, I'm a stem cell biologist uh, uh, working on muscle stem cells. So here's our, our, our first lesson about stem cells. Um, stem cells are the building blocks that, that, uh, that build the body. Uh, we start as a single cell and we end up with billions and billions of cells. And, uh, and each organ within our body has its own reservoir of stem cells, with a few exceptions, that can affect the repair and maintain the, uh, the tissue. And it does this by um, giving rise to cells that then divide, grow, and amplify, and then will differentiate into the skin cell, uh, the skeletal muscle cell, and so on. Um, and uh, stem cells can divide in different ways. Uh, and this is really a, a key concept that, that is turning out to be very, very important. If, if a stem cell divides and makes two stem cells, we're having an increase in the numbers of stem cells. That's called stem cell expansion. It can also renew through an asymmetric division where it gives rise to one stem cell and another cell that will then go on and differentiate, essentially be lost eventually. Or both cells can differentiate. We now know that controlling this choice uh, is really the key to regulate the efficiency of tissue regeneration and that a loss of control of this is really an important player in, in uh, disease and also in aging. As we age, unfortunately, we tend to do way more of this and not enough of this. Um, so by controlling this, we can, uh, and stimulating uh, a healthy response, we can improve the efficiency of tissue regeneration and the repair of damage. For example, damage caused by diseases like Duchenne muscular dystrophy or other neuromuscular diseases. So skeletal muscle has a reservoir of cells called satellite cells. Um, muscle, of course, allows us to move around in a voluntary way. Uh, it's composed of bundles of myofibers with, with uh, thousands of nuclei. They contain the chromosomes and the, the DNA uh, packaged, packaged up nicely. Uh, and um, these so-called satellite cells are the cells that repair and grow the muscle. Uh, and, and a subset of those cells we discovered are the stem cells, the skeletal muscle. And, and work from our lab and many others really has laid out uh, the control, the medical mechanisms that control this process. And a key finding that we made was that stem cells are, uh, sorry, that satellite cells are a 
mixed population of stem cells and cells that then go on and, and, get, and differentiate. And uh, these cells can self-renew through an asymmetric cell division. So here's a photograph of an asymmetric cell division that I showed you in the previous cell. This stem cell is divided and given rise to this green cell that's going to go on and eventually differentiate, leaving behind one stem cell. And control of this decision is really key to controlling the efficiency of muscle repair. Uh, and uh, yeah, this is just a transplantation experiment in mice. If we transplant a, a, um, a green cell, uh, we get only get differentiated muscle fibers and we don't repopulate the stem cell compartment. Uh, and if we transplant the stem cell, we have repopulation of, of the entire muscle with the transplanted stem cell, just like a bone marrow transplantation. Uh, this, so this was evidence that we discovered the stem cell. So looking at the control of asymmetric cell division, we discovered a repair mechanism that the body normally uses uh, to stimulate and control the levels of stem cells in muscle during the repair process. Don't worry, it's a multiple choice test. <laughs> if you choose B, you'll be good. Uh, so, uh, so here's a, a stem cell in muscle. It can divide to make two stem cells, or it can divide asymmetrically to give one, live behind one stem cell and give rise to a cell that will want to differentiate. This protein called WIT7A, which is a secreted protein, uh, it's pushed outside of the cell uh, so that it can talk to multiple cell types. Uh, it stimulates the symmetric expansion of the stem cell, leading into a, an increased numbers of stem cells. And the result is, is that you then have more foot soldiers being generated to affect the repair process. So it results in a huge amplification of the numbers of cells that are being generated that are then capable of affecting the repair of the tissue. And uh, the consequence of, of, of WIT7A doing this is that we have a, a huge acceleration in the repair process. WIN7A also does other things, making it really quite a, an attractive molecule. It stimulates these cells so that they migrate uh, much faster. They have, um, uh, they go faster uh, more of the time, although their maximum speed isn't changed. So the horsepower isn't changed, so they just have their foot in the accelerator uh, more often and for longer periods of time. And their directionality is uh, enhanced, so they don't change direction as often. They go straighter and straight direction. So what this result is, is that they, they migrate way further in tissue. And we can see this in this experiment, that the, the maximal distance of cells that we've transplanted into muscle are, are much wider uh, and, and much greater. Uh, and we also discovered a number of other things around how wind 7 is delivered across the tissue by um, these migrating cells. So that injected protein is taken up by the cells that are at that site, and then they're delivered across the entire uh, uh, muscle tissue. Uh, and this is a, a cross-section of muscle muscles in mice that have been treated with WIN7A. Uh, so uh, when you cut muscle in half, um, uh, you see the fibers on end, so it's like looking at the end of a dowel rather than looking at the length of the, of the dowel. And so those little circles are the ends of muscle fibers. And you can see that not only is the muscle bigger, overall, but these, uh, the diameter of these are, are much bigger. In fact, they're almost twice as big as normal. And there's also an increase in the numbers of fibers that are, that are twice that of normal. And this muscle mass is 18% uh, larger than uh, the untreated muscle. Uh, if all of us had 18.4% more muscle, we'd be feeling very buff and wanting to go to the beach and show off. <laughs> Well, maybe not me, but broader wood, broader wood. That's a lot of muscle. Okay, so what's really uh, very um, attractive about win 7 a is that it acts at multiple levels to stimulate the repair process of the skeletal muscle. Uh, so, uh, so by targeting the stem cell, stimulating the motility of the stem cell, and enhancing the growth of the differentiated fiber, it positively re uh, regulates the repair process and, and markedly enhances it. And the muscle that it is generated is stronger per unit mass. And in fact, we tested this in mouse models of Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and the strengths of those muscles were restored almost to the levels of normal mice, a very dramatic effect. And this was by protein injection into, into these mice. 
We tested human cells in petri dishes and they respond just as the mouse cells do. So this makes this a very attractive molecule to explore for clinical application. Uh, the other thing that we did is WINS7A is a, is a member of a family of proteins called WINS that are awful proteins, that they're, they're sticky, uh, they, they're not very soluble, uh, they're hard to manufacture. And what we found is that if we cut most of it off, the, the C-terminal blue bit that's left behind uh, still works. So this, is, this whole protein uh, is, is WIN7A, and how it works is a, a class, like a clamp the top of the receptor that's on the cell surface. The receptor is called Frizzled 7, and, and the protein clamps the top of it, turning on the response of the cell. But it turned out we didn't need the yellow bit, we threw that away, and the blue bit works perfectly normal and has a full range of, of, uh, of therapeutic effects. This is uh, terrific, because what this means is that we can uh, further modify this to enhance, uh, this is the, the industry people call this productizing. I always, I always want to say weaponized, but productizing <laughs> the protein uh, so that it, they, they can manufacture it in large amounts very, and, and purify it uh, and deliver it. Uh, it also means that we can potentially fuse this with other proteins so that it can be delivered not just by injection into the muscle, but through the blood system, which would be very attractive. But that's still being worked on. What's next? Where are we going with this? So um, uh, Robin talked about screening for drugs. Well, we're fully involved with this in a big way. We've developed strategies to screen for drugs that, that will act like WIN7A to stimulate the symmetric expansion of muscle stem cells. Uh, in an earlier version of the screen, we conducted a small, uh, smaller screen. Rather than doing 200,000 compounds, we did 150. Uh, we identified drugs that stimulate the symmetric expansion of stem cells, muscle stem cells, just like WIN7A, and we've tested them in animals, and they work just the same. Unfortunately, you don't want to use these drugs in humans because they have other side effects. But the principle that we can identify drugs that, that work just like when 7 a has been proven, and we're pursuing that very, very actively. So these diseases are very complicated and difficult to treat. They're going to take, I, I believe, a, a constellation of a cocktail approach where different aspects of the disease are going to have to be targeted by multiple drugs. So this is one element of the picture. Stimulating and mobilizing stem cells does not cure the genetic basis of the disease, but it could change a, um, a, a disease like Duchenne muscular dystrophy um, to a chronic condition uh, and enhance the quality of life. And uh, that's our goal. And, and uh, um, I think all of us fervently believe that, that these, this is coming. We have reached the tipping point where clinical trials now are going to be conducted and being conducted in, in Canada. Certainly, stem cell research has paved the road for regenerative medicine uh, to reach the clinic. Um, and regenerative medicine is disruptive technology. Uh, you remember we all used to have cameras with 35 millimeter film, and now those are no longer exist. Kodak went bankrupt at the time. You know, years ago, we never could imagine Kodak going bankrupt. That's disruptive technology. Well, regenerative medicine is also disruptive technology. It's going to change the practice of medicine and uh, we'll see it come in our lifetimes. Thank you very much. So I think I'm a little lower than Dr. Rudnicki here. So thank you very much for Dr. That was a great talk. You can see why that merits the Order of Canada. So we'd also like to thank Dr. Marla Spiegel for coming from Muscular Dystrophy Canada and giving a great overview of what services are provided, and Dr. Hugh McMillan for talking about some of the research that's happening at CHEO. So we just want to say thank you. And we'd also like to say thank you for coming. We know everybody gives up a lot of time to make their way down here tonight. And we'd like to open the floor to questions. Um, there's a microscope, a microphone, sorry. That's a Freudian slip provided. So um, if anyone wants to move to the microphone, that'd be great. Or we can, we might be able to run a microphone over if people are, um, any, if there's any challenges there. And we also, oh sorry, and actually I forgot to say thank you to Dr. David Park for giving the opening remarks as well. That was great, thank you.
Kaya. Hi, thank you to everyone for this uh, great talk. I had um, some question. I'm not sure who could answer this. Dr. Park. Park can answer it. Um, I heard that there's a lot of research going on, and this is fabulous. Um, is there any research that is being done on not only um, pharmaceutical treatment, I heard a little bit about a different type of approach for one of the conditions. Um, is there any other research being done on other type of treatment approach or other types of treatment? Um, is there any also research being done on environmental risks that could impact or on populations such as the population you've uh, mentioned? Um, to see what might be possibly environmental factors that may contribute to these illnesses. And lastly, um, I wanted to know if within your research, um, either through the institute or in your research protocol, do you ever integrate patient consultation? So there's quite a few questions there, that's great. Um, does someone want to, I don't know if anyone in the panel wants to address about the potential sort of landscape of research. Yeah, okay. I think this is on. Uh, so it's a very, very interesting question. And um, I think the, the research that we're, we're conducting and um, that some of my colleagues are conducting, it's, it's many different spheres. And I think you pointed out some very important areas. Um, I think what hits the, the news a lot and what all of us are absolutely hoping for is some cure-based research. So certainly there's a lot of money and a lot of media attention that's directed towards that. But particularly myself being a clinician who works very, very hard um, with people that have neuromuscular diseases and their families, um, a lot of the research that we do, um, I'd say in the trenches, but it's, it's about quality of life type research making sure that it's not just about extending the years, but it's also about making sure that people um, live life and love life and feel good and, um, and, and are getting the best care possible. So, so some of it is also focused very much on improving the, the quality of life. Some of it is research in the third area, I'd say, is really focusing on surveillance testing. And that's to make sure that if we can find evidence to say that you know, people with condition A should have this test done every year or every three years, then we can then go to provincial governments where there's differences across the country and say, look, we found evidence that in order to provide the best care possible, we need to be doing these surveillance tests on a regular basis. So when we can find evidence, um, scientific evidence for um, for something, then we can go to the government and provide rationale where they should um, open their purse strings and start uh, and start paying for for uh, uh, for tests. And the very last area I mentioned, um, it, there's also a lot of research that's done that doesn't get a lot of media attention on more of the uh, the qualitative side. And I think that's what's getting at when you were talking about environmental uh, factors and um, quality of life. You know, that's also something that's that's very important. Um, and, and that there is a lot of attention paid to that from a research basis, it often doesn't hit the news though, because the, the media doesn't seem to be particularly interested in that. But, but there is research going on in that area. I, I think from a, a basic science uh, point of view, um, just I, I would say that every lab that is part of our center uh, has their own angle in therapy development. Uh, so everyone's looking at the problem, perhaps a different disease. Some people work on spinal muscular atrophy, some people work more on Duchenne muscular dystrophy, but everybody's looking at some sort of angle of the system where they can potentially develop a, a new therapeutic. So there's a variety of things that at least at the, the basic science level are being approached. So my research, for example, I'm, I'm a virologist by training. And the area that I work in is gene therapy. So many of these uh, disorders that we've been talking about today are due to mutations in, in genes. And the idea behind gene therapy is if we simply just take a good copy of the gene and we're able to introduce it into, for example, muscle cells, 
then perhaps we'd be able to, to uh, cure Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And so, so my particular research is you trying to use viruses to deliver these good copies of the, the genes into, into cells. And so we're, we're pursuing that type of angle. And like I said, I, I would say that every research lab that we have is, is investigating some sort of angle on, on that type of thing. In my case, it's viruses. Other people work on small molecules. Other people work on stem cell therapies. We have so many people here in Ottawa working on these uh, tissues and these disorders that we, we have quite a, a variety of different approaches. Thank you. I'll just speak very quickly. Uh, your final part of your question was around patient engagement. Um, and absolutely, I mean, I think it's evidenced by the fact that they, that tonight, uh, Muscular Industry Canada, which is a patient organization, was uh, invited to come and be part of this panel. But um, in more specifically, um, patient-oriented research, as it's called now in the CIHR vernacular, is is uh, is a big area of investment and. Um, there, without going into the uh, details, there's a call out right now for um, networks to be formed that are uh, all about, the, the, the acronym is SPORE, which is a Strategy for Patient-Oriented Research. And so, um, Muscular Dystrophy Canada is supporting the application, which is being developed by uh, clinicians and researchers across actually rare disease, so it's even bigger than neuromuscular, um, to, to develop a, a network, a uh, five-year network for, um, and that's all patient-oriented research. Our role has been to sort of spread the word about that, and give people, folks out there, an opportunity to share their input, um, tell their stories, and, and, and help shape those research questions. So. Thank you very much. Uh, now, is, I think there's some other questions uh, in the audience. Okay, thank you. Hi, thank you very much. I was wondering how much information there is in the region with neuromyalis optica, as you know, the treatment really takes the, your energy uh, because it reduces your immune system to, to deal with that. So I was wondering how much work or if there's any in this region researching this area to find alternative treatments to, uh, to that area. That rare disease. I'll probably field that one. Um, so the NMO, so most of them, that's an autoimmune inflammatory disorder, and um, a lot of the research would be done through the multiple sclerosis clinic at the on the fourth floor of the general with Mark Freeman, um, and Dr. Freeman does a lot of actually with uh, stem cell research, um, and has so he'd probably be the it's it's not sort of typically under the neuromuscular disease platform, but we do have very uh, prominent research going on in Ottawa for NMO, and he would be the best person to talk to. So sorry, Jody. Yeah. Uh, along the lines, I yeah. know it's short, yeah. uh, a limited amount of time, yeah. many, many diseases under your umbrella, yeah. but uh, could you just briefly mention the things that are going on in ALS also? So there is some basic science research. Dr. Johnny Engsey is here today. He can put his hand up and wave. Yeah. Um, and Dr. Derek Giving just received a large award from uh, his ALS Canada. Um, so there is ongoing ALS research. Of course, we've got the ALS clinic that is at the Rehabilitation Center. And then one of the, there's also uh, more genetic testing that's now being offered for patients with inherited ALS syndrome. So we're more and more finding that there's some, uh, sometimes there's ongoing novel mutations that cause ALS. So we're, the research is really uh, moving forward in that direction as well. And of course, we've, I talked earlier about the Neuromuscular Clinical Trial Unit that we'd like to open up uh, next year. Hi, thank you. Um, I was wondering if stem cell uh, therapy would be applicable to Alzheimer's disease? Well, I can take a shot at that. Um, I think stem cell therapy for the brain still remains a, a very large challenge. Uh, I think that um, where there has been progress, so transplanting cells in the brain and, and having them connect correctly, and, and uh, especially an older patient, uh, hasn't been shown to be effective. There are certainly 
clinics offshore that offer those sorts of treatments. Uh, caveat emptor, if it sounds too good to be true, it's too good to be true. Uh, those clinics are designed to separate people, desperate people from money. Uh, and they're very effective at it. And uh, there, there are numerous patients who've been um, severely damaged by those sorts of treatments or killed. Uh, and those are well documented. There are some really interesting uh, treatments being developed um, to mobilize stem cells in the brain uh, and affect repair. Uh, Frida Miller in Toronto uh, uh, has done some really pioneering work exploring the use of the drug metformin uh, to stimulate uh, cells. Uh, Jing Wang, working here in Ottawa, came from her lab and uh, set up a program to, uh, to pursue those studies that she did in Frida's lab. Uh, and they're doing a clinical trial right now, in, um, in, which is a multi-site clinical trial for children who've received radiation in the brain to treat cancer, and combining metformin, which is a very safe drug used normally to treat type 2 diabetes, with exercise. So metformin plus exercise, and uh, to stimulate uh, uh, growth and repair of the brain. And it, uh, potentially those sorts of things might also work in, in other patients, perhaps not with metformin, but. Uh, so I'm going to start the stem cell debate early, because we're going to talk about this, what day is today? Tomorrow. And uh, it, 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 Michael is absolutely right. But the problem is, metformin does a lot of things. Right? So you put, it in the, you put it in the human body, and uh, you may see improvement, you may not see improvement, but is it because you're mobilizing stem cells, or is it doing something other? Right. Um, so these are all, and, and I think Michael hit it actually on the head, of the problems with Alzheimer's versus something that is uh, a little bit more uh, perhaps defined as in simple in the structure of the circuitry of the brain. Right? But, but I mean, look, uh, I, I study Parkinson's, right? And stem cell therapy for Parkinson's has always been touted as the number one disease that's going to be treated by stem cells, this is it. If anything is going to work, it's going to work for Parkinson's. And guess what? Not so, not so simple. <laughs> now, so what, what's been happening is that um, the reason for some of the, the excitement about stem cells for Parkinson's was the initial observations that if you actually take real neurons that generate dopamine. These are the ones that die off in Parkinson's. And you put them into patients, and neurosurgeons were doing this, you have remarkable before and after pictures. Right? It's like, uh, you know, before the diet and after the diet. But really remarkable. And as it turns out, they did a couple double-blind studies, and what this really means is that to control for whether or not you're actually thinking you're doing better, is that they would drill a hole into your head, because that's how you get the stem cells in. Um, drill a hole, but not give you the stem cells, but you have no idea if you got it or not. And when they did that kind of study, absolutely no benefit. Right? And so it, it made people realize, what are we doing? How should we do it? What's wrong? Where should we put the stem cells? If we have stem cells, should we mobilize endogenously? So all these questions are coming up. Anyway. I preempt tomorrow. <laughs> I will not be speaking tomorrow. So if there are no more questions, we'll close off the evening. We'd like to thank you very much for coming. And we're going to remain available for a few minutes. So thank you very much. So, hold on. I have a surprise. Are we up there? OK, so, uh, so I have a surprise. And before we do that, we'll all be here. And thank you very much. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's a, there's a, I feel like I'm on a, a, a stand-up comic or something, but, um, you know, we uh, really do feel, and someone questioned about putting the patient, uh, patient-based research, uh, really focusing on the individual who is suffering from a variety of neuromuscular disorders. Um, and that's our mantra for the brain and mind. So how do we actually do things, whether it be re regular research or in um, clinically oriented research to actually make an impact as quickly as possible? And our also uh, thinking is, is that, in fact, 
because many in the community, not just neuromuscular ALS, but in stroke and Parkinson's, uh, have had the pleasure of being in these communities and, and, and people who survive and suffer from these conditions are amazingly strong and fierce. And so we tried to put together a video to promote the brain and mind, but also have these concepts involved in it. And some of you have seen it already many times. The reason I mention it today, so you can see it, but also, <laughs> Uh, we needed actual real people because we didn't use, everyone in the video is real. So they're real patients, real physicians, and one of the actors, you'll see. Can we play that video, please? Our patients are strong. Every day they live with neurological disorders such as Parkinson's disease, stroke, depression, and ALS. And every day they fight to maintain their quality of life. Seulement une recherche novatrice ainsi que des soins cliniques à la fine pointe de la technologie peuvent les aider. We are here to make it happen. Par une meilleure compréhension de la complexité du cerveau, nous pourrons découvrir son aptitude à s'adapter, à changer et à guérir. Reduce suicide by 20% by the year 2020. Personalize Parkinson's care. And eliminate the effects of stroke. Thank you, Jody. Thank you, Jody. So, enjoy. There's more. Get a chance to talk if you were shy to our researchers. Uh, thank you very much for coming.